On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, we talk with an abuse survivor named Tiff, and Tiff was in a relationship with a dehumanizing abuser. It's a story of put-downs, button-pushing, deflecting responsibility, misogyny, and power. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. I am Brandon Chadwick, and with me today, we have Tiff. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. Well, thank you for being here. And if you want to be a guest like Tiff is today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com and click on the guest form button at the top of the page. And there you can read all of our instructions and please read them all and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out the guest form and press the submit button. And please do send it in the format that we ask for. And there is no content warning for today's episode, for today's survivor story. And today you're going to hear Tiff's story. And Tiff was in a relationship with a water torturer from Lundy Bancroft's list of abuser types in the book, Why Does He Do That? And this made Tiff really question what was really going on. So a big thank you to Tiff for being here. And now I'm going to get out of my way and your way. Tiff, the floor is now yours. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, my my family life growing up was it was pretty chaotic. Um, it was a very loving home. I grew up with pretty decent, like financial security and um, privilege, but uh, there was a lot of like emotional depravity in a lot of ways. I have two siblings, and they. Um, used pretty hard drugs. They were in and out of our home. And, um, my mom was, had a pretty severe mental illness and my father, um, held a, a position that was pretty high up. And so he was working a lot and just not really present. And my parents got divorced when I was young and uh, I, I was never close with my stepfather. So I, while there was love, there was, uh, also a lot of fighting and, um, I, I witnessed, you know, my stepdad leave and come back and this like, uh, chaos that just was pretty persistent. And, uh, in turn, my mom leaned pretty heavily on me, um, from around age eight or so for her own emotional, um, like dependency. Basically, I was basically her little therapist and, um, when I started dating, when I was really young, my mom, I was like 13 when I had my first boyfriend. And I remember telling my mom something that he had done that was super sweet. And my mom said, just remember, this is as good as it's going to get. And she would reiterate pretty often that relationships get worse over time. And I, I think, you know, I've had to do a lot of unlearning around that. Um, but that was kind of programmed into my psyche from a super young age. And as far as your home goes, there was chaos. Mm -hmm. So how did that chaos affect you at a young age? Obviously, based upon what you said already, there's a parentification that is gone on with you and your mom. But what, are you know the effects of this environment having on you that you don't realize at the time and then also that you maybe do realize at the time sure yeah i i had pretty low self-worth at a young age and i had felt because i grew up in a pretty affluent neighborhood but there was like there were cops at my house with regularity due to like my brothers or, you know, fighting. And I felt pretty differentiated from a lot of my peers. And so I felt isolated. I would kind of escape 
from a super young age, um, immersing myself in books. I would play like hours of The Sims um, and just kind of disassociate that way. I, I really learned to kind of retreat into myself. Uh, and then at school, I was, I had friends and everything, but I, I just never felt like I fit in. And so I, I craved love pretty significantly. And within your relationships from age 13 on, were they healthy relationships, even though that you were a teenager or were they all over the place? They were pretty much all over the place. I actively sought after people who, you know, now as an adult, I know that you know, my nervous system was dysregulated. And so I went after people who you know, were emotionally unavailable or um, kind of wishy-washy and, and that adrenaline that I felt and that anxiety uh, kind of learned really young that that's how relationships were. They were just up and down and, you know, breaking up and getting back together and arguing. And I have had healthy, like I had one healthy relationship in my adulthood uh, for about five years. Um, but I, I didn't really know how to handle that. But uh, outside of that, all my relationships that I had been in were not on the healthy end. So as a teen, you have friends, as, as you stated, but you feel like you're lonely within that world. You feel different. So when you see yourself, how do you see yourself? And at this point, you know, do you have a plan for the future? Like, this is what I want. Do I want a, a house, a picket fence, two and a half children, in a partner or, you know, do I want, you know, to just be single in the city, work on my career, whatever you choose to do? Um, or are you just like, I don't know. And just trying to figure it out. I was, I was floundering. I, at age 13, I started drinking alcohol, experimenting with substances and that carried on. Uh, until about three years ago, but um, I got involved and in, you know hung out with people who were a lot older than me. I was seeking love in in places that that didn't exist, trying to find myself and just kept getting more lost. Um, but I I did have friends. I did feel loved, but I did I, I felt different. There was something inside of me that just felt really isolated and. Um, I, I, it's not that I didn't have goals. I just, my, my self-worth was so low that I didn't see a future in which I could be successful or, you know, financially stable, a anything that my peers were maybe aiming for. You know, I, I, I did end up going to college, but it was that whole process. I didn't have any idea of like what I wanted to do or anything like that. And I, I didn't have as much parental supervision at home. So I just felt like I was kind of floating and figuring it out. And um, I remember being like kind of jealous of my friends whose parents were guiding them in a direction. I felt like I grew up really young. And so I, you know, people would say, oh, you're such an old soul, which I, as an adult now looking back, I don't know how I feel about people saying that to like a 14 year old, but I felt like I needed to get out of my hometown, that there was a world that was out there for me, but I, I didn't know how to access it, but I did feel not more mature necessarily, but I felt more experienced and more self-aware than a lot of my peers because I did so much reflection from a really young age, um, trying to figure out who I was and 
why things were happening and what was going on. And um, I did tend to escape kind of often through substances, but there, I was a deep thinker even while drinking. Did you feel that you took care of others and you just wanted a break? Absolutely. So children to you were not a hundred percent appealing in a lot of no. ways because you already, you already raised people. I told my mom at a really young age that I had no interest in children and she would consistently say, Oh, your mind can change. You'll never know. And uh, it's kind of maintained that I'm not super interested in becoming a mother. I love children. I like to spend time with them. I have friends who have children, but yeah, it's just never appealed to me personally. So you, you've gone through all of this and eventually you meet the person that this story is about. So take us through meeting this person and give us a good 3d picture of who they were back then, what they wanted in life, how they wanted to be seen, and then how they really were. Sure. So I met my partner, former partner, uh, through friends in a 12-step program. So at the time that he and I met, I had just graduated from graduate school. I just had hit a year of sobriety. Um, I was really focused on myself. Uh, I was grieving. My mother had died about seven months prior. And I was putting in a lot of work on myself. And I was extremely focused on, you know, my female friendships. But I will say that I think deep down, I was hoping for a true romantic connection. Um, but I had given myself a goal of staying single for that first year of my sobriety. Um, but we met, there was a, a group of us that on Friday nights, we would, we would play this one particular board game. And um, we just sort of had this immediate connection where we both kind of shared dark humor. And uh, I was empathetic from his own recovery from uh, a particular substance that one of my siblings had used. And um, I remember one day asking if he could help me drill something into my wall in my apartment because he had mentioned he had like a, a number of tools and um, I didn't have any proper tools. So when he first came over to my apartment, he, you know, help me with that task. Um, but then I, re I do remember that, you know, in hindsight now he began kind of critiquing other areas in my apartment that he thought, you know, needed tending to. And he was like, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to fix this. I'm going to fix this. And, uh, that gave us the opportunity to see one another one-on-one, -on -one, like on a more regular basis. And, you know, when he would be over doing these things, I would cook and we would just kind of get to know a little bit about one another as each hangout happened. And uh, he had asked me one time via text message if I was interested in being friends with benefits. And I was like, absolutely not. That sounds super messy. And I kept a little bit of a distance from him after that. Uh, he was pretty persistent. Um, and I think deep down, I had, I admittedly liked the attention a little bit. And I agreed, um, you know, a few months later to date him. Um, and uh, initially, I thought that, you know, he presented as this super sweet, super attentive a guy who who listened and um you know liked cats he was this gentle soul uh i thought and um it, it felt as almost as though once he had me hooked that that changed um but i was already 
you know, giving him this opportunity. And also because we were both in recovery, I kept thinking to myself, okay, well, he's just growing. He's, he's changing. You know, he, he does really care about you. Um, and I guess, you know, the red flags that were from the, the get go were regarding my body, um, or clothing, you know, like, oh, those shorts could be a little bit shorter or, um, I had mentioned that I wanted to dye my hair brown and he said, I prefer blondes and they, the, the insults kept getting, uh, personal and, and digging. But I, like I said, I would be kind of in shock each time this happened. And then he would immediately apologize and also kind of deflect my emotions in the process. So early on here, he's, made his way into your life as someone who is helpful doing things around your house, getting to know you, he gets his foot in in the door. And then there's this digging remarks part. Both of you are in recovery and, you know, within that group, are you telling everyone, Hey, we're dating. And then two, how does the group, because those people are your world, you know, especially when you're earlier in your recovery, like those people are huge for you. So how are they viewing you and how do they view him? Because they probably know him better than anyone, because at least in that place, he's supposed to be as honest and vulnerable as possible. Yeah. So I had fear of judgment pretty early on because I had more than a year of sobriety at that point. And he had less than one year of sobriety. And I remember when he asked me, you know, to go out on a date, my initial reaction was for him to ask, talk to his sponsor about it. And I talked to mine and uh, he had informed me that his sponsor gave him the green light. I, I don't know if that's true or not, but he was very open from the get go that we started dating. It was almost as though I was a trophy. Um, people were pretty supportive from the start. I mean, they would, you know, comment on how cute we were together and, um, you know, I, I, our lives had become so enmeshed that once the the digs started happening it it was almost as though that enmeshment made it really hard for me to separate i was i was super fearful of judgment from others and um i i look back and I think I knew from the very start that this was not a relationship that was going to be fulfilling to me, but I I didn't really know what to do. So the relationship progressed in the sense that he wanted to spend a lot of time with me. And I just, he was very much into, like I said, like letting people know that we were dating and wanting to do all sorts of social events together. He really leaned into like the quality time aspect of, you know, and it was the early days of a relationship. Uh, I, you know, had suggested to him before we started dating that, you know, I would go out with him under the, I don't want to say rule, but the notion that both of us would be able to maintain our own friendships, like me with my female friendships, he with his male friendships. And that he, he, I I tried my best to maintain that, but he sort of deviated from that. He was either wanting to spend time with me or totally isolate and play video games. But, um, I would say the devaluation started maybe about four months in. So it was pretty early 
into the relationship. At one point, he showed me a video of a porn star and was like, I really like her um, making these comments about oh why don't you wear high heels more or I really like how she's wearing that and or I like how her hair looks and it was just these these comments that made me feel less than and fortunately I I didn't let that impact me too much at that time but it it did create this bond because then there would, he would say these really dark comments, but then there would be this intermittent like love where he would be extremely complimentary, apologetic. And then, you know, oh, maybe a week later, tell me that I was too dramatic and I'm always upset about something. Um, but there was, one in particular was my birthday and it was my first birthday without my mother. And it was our first birthday together, like as a, as a couple, uh, my first birthday as a couple with him. And I woke up in that on that morning and he had just totaled his car like a couple days prior. And he needed me to follow behind him in his car, in my car, so that it was safe for him to drive so that this company could come pick it up. And I had taken the day off of work. I wanted to have a super relaxing day. And I agreed to follow behind him. I, I didn't even question it. And when we got to his apartment where the company was picking up the car, uh, he was doing that and handling that. And I was getting phone calls from uh, several family members. And because it was my birthday, you know, everybody's calling and wishing me a happy birthday. And I was crying because people were like, you know, mentioning, uh, asking how I was doing, uh, given that it was my, you know, first time without my mom celebrating. And uh, when he was all of a sudden done with this company, I was on the phone with one of my uncles. And I remember looking at him and kind of signaling, like, I'll be right off the phone. And he looked so angry as though I was inconveniencing him. And when I got off that phone call, we got into my car and I had all I wanted to do that evening for my birthday was just have a simple picnic on the beach. And I had mentioned that I thought I was going to make spring rolls. And he, his first reaction was just make sure that they're not bland. And I was like, I, I don't make bland food. I'm what do you mean by that? And he said, just make sure that they're seasoned. In fact, you should season them with gochujang, which is a Korean paste. Um, and I, I was so taken aback that that's that directness and, and the demanding nature of, you know, me just simply saying what I wanted to make. I love cooking and I love Asian food and he then, I, I think I jokingly asked, like, is there any other requests, my prince? And he was like, yeah, you should actually make a charcuterie board instead. And I think that'll be easier to transport. And I feel a lot of shame saying this, but I actually went and spent a decent amount of my day trying to make the best charcuterie board that I could. And later that evening, uh, I got to his apartment before we went to the beach and I had called my best friend and I, I said to her, I have this feeling that he didn't get me anything. I just have this feeling. And she said, there's no way. And she's like, this is your first birthday without your mom. This is your first birthday together. There's no way. I said, okay. And I went up to his apartment and he had not gotten me anything. And I just kind of stood there and I was not even a card. And I was like, did you not get me anything for my birthday? And he said, when would I have had the time? And that was kind of the start of a series of special days that were just for me, whether it was my birthday or a sobriety day or I mean, you name it, the, any, anything that was supposed to be special for me, he 
could not recognize or acknowledge. And there was there were these extra jabs on days like that. From there, I continued to question within myself if we should, you know, be together. And a couple months after my birthday, I'd moved into the apartment where I currently live and there was a lot going on. I, I moved in here. I was starting a new job uh, that was a very exciting opportunity. I'm still at that job, but there was a lot going on, a lot of movement, um, not only into this apartment, but into a new office. And I have my own office space. So that required a, a lot of extra work on my end. And when I moved in here, uh, my my elderly cat started getting sick and I didn't know if it was something environmental or what. And uh, I was just under a lot of stress. And a couple of weeks after that, my grandfather passed away. And I, on the day of his funeral, I had to fly to a different state. And on the day of his funeral, my former partner did not reach out to me one time at all, no phone call or text. And that was a really hard day because my grandfather was buried next to my mom and it hadn't even been a year since she died. So there was just a lot of heavy emotions. And, you know, in the back of my head, I'm thinking how my cat was sick. And so I was under a lot of stress, but I was trying to just maintain this semblance of strength and tap into my resilience. But uh, when I did come home my from my grandfather's funeral, my cat ended up passing away. Uh, but in that time, my former partner told me that uh, he feared like he was losing me and I wasn't paying enough attention to him uh, as I was tending to my ailing cat. And like I said, she was a senior and um, I, she was my world. And it was just so devastating that that's kind of how he viewed the situation was how my attention to my cat was affecting him. And a few weeks after she passed away, I went to a shelter just to pet some cats. I was not planning on adopting one. And I went and I was meeting all these little kitties and I came across this one. He was so chill. He was two years old. I confirmed with like seven different people at this you know, shelter that he was healthy. And I asked if I could put him on hold for 48 hours because I wanted to talk to, you know, people within my, my support group and my father and, um, my partner as well, uh, you know, run it by them, whether I should adopt a new cat or not. I didn't know if it was too soon or not. And, 48 hours later, I brought the little guy home and the shelter informed me that he had been showing some signs of uh, sickness. He was drinking a lot of water. He had bloody fecal matter. And I was just super overwhelmed, but they said it was probably just stress. And so I brought him home anyway. And long story short, over the course of five weeks, I, I took him to the vet every week because there was some new development and that was really expensive. It was super overwhelming. I felt like I was running a hospice out of my home, uh, but I was still keeping everything clean and staying on top of everything. But um, he ended up being diagnosed with something that was incurable that only cats get that I think he caught in the kennel. And um I ended up having to put him down. Uh, but before that, when I, when I made the phone call to put him down, my former partner looked over at me and said, are you going to go in with him to be euthanized? And I said, uh, yeah. And he said, that's so weird. It's almost as though you like death. And at that point, I just felt this pang in my heart because my grandfather had died about a month prior. My other cat had just passed away. My mom's one year death anniversary had literally just happened. And I've also lost one of my siblings to uh, their drug addiction. And I don't like death by any means. It's, it's something that has been around me in life, but I think I handle it 
pretty well. So hearing that was so not supportive in that moment. It, it was like a gut punch. Uh, he did end up coming with me to put the kitty down and it was really sad. And afterward, we you know, went to a grocery store and I couldn't figure out something in, in making a choice. And he said, can't you make a fucking decision for once in your life? And uh, 20 minutes prior, I just had to put another cat down. And um, that just felt, again, like just so dark. And I spent the the whole car ride to my apartment uh, trying to explain to him why that hurt my feelings. I felt like I was going crazy. And we got back here and he immediately went into my home office and started critiquing the cleanliness of my closet and telling me I needed to vacuum. And it turned into a, a pretty big argument. I just remember feeling extremely overwhelmed. And at this point, I was too embarrassed to tell friends that he had been saying, you know, treating me like that in the midst of, of all this grief. But I fortunately had a, a lot of support around me because that was a really chaotic time in my life. So. After my cats had passed, he was saying things to me like um, I was unlucky and it was hard for him to deal with all the death. And he told me that he had been extremely supportive throughout that process. And that was just simply not true. But uh, anytime I would threaten to leave the relationship, he would get upset. And so in, in those times where I would threaten to leave the relationship and there would be this kind of like love bomby type dynamic going on, um, I would feel as though there was a balance again in the relationship. And there was a point in time last summer where you know, there had been some months of feeling like there was some semblance of balance. and. I was at work and one day, I believe it was a Wednesday, and he had texted me and he asked if we could watch his friend's dog that weekend. Now, I love that particular dog. I love animals in general. And since at that time, there were no animals in my apartment anymore, I was certainly willing. And so it's also pretty excited to be able to spend some quality time with my former partner. Um, when we went and picked up the dog, my former partner informed me that his video game had released a new version earlier that day and that he was going to be back at his apartment playing for the night and that he would spend the entirety of the next day with me and the dog, you know, cause this was a joint effort. And so I got upset, but he had confirmed that he would share some of the responsibility the following day. So I kind of let it slide. Um, he proceeded to play his video game until 4 a.m. And so he was not awake until about 5 p.m. the following day. And so by the time he had woken up, I had taken that dog on a walk. I had arranged a play date with one of my friend's dogs. I took the dog to the dog park. I had walked her, fed her, played with her, all, all of the things. And uh, when he called me when he woke up, I tried to be really upbeat. And he told me that he'd pick me up in an hour to go over to our mutual friend's apartment for a game night that night. And he picked me up at 6.30 p.m. We brought his friend's dog to this game night. And we were at the game night until about 10 p.m. And after that game night, he informed me that, again, he was going to be playing his video game. And so at this point, I, I was angry. And he screamed at me, told me I was psycho. I remember feeling like I was crazy. Um, you know, he dropped me off. He did not say goodnight. And throughout this entire entirety of the weekend, at no point did he really watch this dog besides bringing the dog with us to this game night for about four hours. And it was interesting because, you know, he had dropped me off. He did not say goodnight. 
And I didn't hear from him until about 2 p.m. the following day. And when I got home, my best friend who happened to be at that gathering, the game night, she called me and she said, I just need you to know that I don't like the way he speaks to you. She's like, I noticed it. And I noticed that your demeanor changed. I noticed you were getting defensive. And I I don't like that. And I felt seen and I felt super validated, but I, I remember just kind of like deflecting it a bit and being like, yeah, he was just tired. You know, we have those days. And, um, the following day when he had reached out to me at about 2 PM, I brought up that I had felt like my emotions were overlooked by this entire experience with, with me babysitting this dog all weekend on my own. And he looked at me with a smug face in the calmest demeanor and said, you know, I was watching you mow down on snacks last night and it made me fear that I'm going to lose sexual attraction to you one day. And you know, I asked why, like, excuse me. And he said, well, you used to work out extremely hard. And now when I see you at the gym, you're just walking on the treadmill and it's unattractive to me. And I'm by no means overweight. Not that that matters. No, but I'm in great shape and I'm also allowed to eat snacks, but I was totally taken aback. And I asked him, do you not think that I'm in shape? And he said, eh, you're getting there. And I was going to see a concert that night. And as I was getting ready, he was then complimenting me, telling me how hot I am, how good I looked. And it just felt like so confusing. And I I just could not understand what was happening. And again, it was another important day. I had been waiting for this concert for literal months and it, it just felt like I couldn't just at least have like one thing to be excited about without him having something to say that was going to really hurt my feelings. And it also sounds like when you wanted to go and talk to him about this thing that hurt your feelings, that you didn't get to talk about what hurt your feelings. And then he deflects in a, in a way not to blame you for something, but to get on your case about something. So the thing you wanted to talk about gets shifted to this new thing which you then have a right to be upset about that as well. And then later he tries to smooth it over, which puts you in a state of not knowing what's going on. Absolutely. And the following day, he had texted me while I was at work and doubled down and was like, you know, I think it's fair that everyone wants their partner to be as fit as possible. You know what I'm talking about. And if you can't handle that, that's on you. But you know that most people want their partner to be taking care of themselves. And I just felt so taken aback that we were still talking about this. And I remember just responding to him and saying, thank you for saying that. And I sent a heart emoji. and. I am apologizing. It's like he's using society to triangulate you or the society's norms or beliefs to triangulate you into feeling bad about yourself. And for him to have some sort of moral, not that it's moral, but maybe in his mind he thinks it is, a high ground in which his argument makes sense. Does that make sense? Absolutely. That was my experience is he would totally deflect. He was so entitled. He thought that he was the bee's knees. When I met him, he was wearing 
you know, designer clothes, but living in this really small, dirty studio, it just didn't match up. He was so obsessed with the exterior and of everyone. I remember one time we were in Costco and he made a comment about this family that was just innocently waiting in line to get pizza or hot dog or whatever they were getting. And he called them filthy. And I just, that is not how my brain operates whatsoever. So it just felt like these like really intensely judgmental comments, not only on my physical appearance, but the physical appearance of others. But then it was expected that I would compliment him and, and hold him in high regard for how he went to the gym. And I'm not trying to be rude here, but he's not physically fit, but that's not something that was important to me. So he's been insensitive during many moments where it's inappropriate. He's super critical. He's triangulating. He's commenting about your weight, what you eat. He has double standards as well. He's controlling and manipulating you to conform. So when it comes to him, you know, where does he come from? And are you empathetic to what he's gone through? And something you sent me in your notes, you also read Lundy Bancroft's book, Why Does He Do That in This Time? So how does that change things as well? So he was an only child. He was raised by a single mother. He had never known his birth father. And his stepdad came into his life later in life, and they were not close. He had disclosed to me that he was bullied as a child. He had friends, but then they cut him off in elementary school, and and he began retreating into playing video games at that time. And it it just sounded like a really sad, isolated childhood where he didn't really have anybody to communicate with besides these friends that he would make virtually. And it it touched on my heart because I just, at this point, you know, loved him and I loved him for who he was. You know, there were wonderful qualities about him, which I can get to, but, um, hearing, you know, imagining somebody you love going through pain at such a young age was certainly, you know, pulled on my heartstrings, like I said. So um, in addition to that, I mean, he was really funny. He was super caring when he wanted to be. He would leave me little notes throughout you know, my apartment or get me random cards just because he was attentive, wanted to spend time. Um, He, he could be very loving and we did have a lot of fun. And those were the moments that kept me hooked. And I, I recognize now that that was love bombing, but I didn't really fully comprehend what was going on, but it would follow that cycle of, you know, love bombing, devalue, discard, not fully, but emotionally discard, it felt like, and then he would hoover me back in and and do all the love bombing. And it, the cycle got shorter over time, but I, I had a lot of empathy and care for him. And in addition to his, his substance use history, I, it was again, very isolating. Whereas my addiction was a lot of partying. There was a lot of socialization. We, and he, that's something he would remind me of often too. So before we started this call, you added a story that we didn't know if we wanted to tell, but it seems like this is a good spot for it. And it just kind of shows the epitome of who he is. And it has to do with an AA meeting and being asked to speak in front of the group. So walk us through this story. So I was asked to give a, a lead 
in my 12 step program and what that means is we we share our experience with our addiction what it was like what happened uh that made us want to choose a sober life and and what it's like to live a sober life now and i had been asked to give a lead at this pretty large meeting and uh the person who asked me uh inquired about two months prior to when i was going to be giving the lead and this was when I, I was so detached from my partner. I, I didn't want him to be there. I wasn't really telling him anything about the ongoings of my life. And so I just didn't mention it to him. And about a week before I was going to give this lead, he had found out that I had been asked and he approached me. We were sitting on the couch and he said, I didn't realize you were, you were giving a lead at this meeting. And I said, yeah, I am. And he said, oh, well, I'm going to go because I bet Brian will ask me to also give a lead. And I remember thinking that was such a weird response. But at that point, I, I was pretty tuned out. But I, I clocked that. And you know, a week later, it's time to go to the meeting and I was about to leave. And I, you know, I was like, Hey, I'm going to go. Would you like to join? And he said, yeah, I'll drive. And he said, again, I, I bet Brian's going to ask us to give the lead or ask me to give the lead. And I just, you know, whatever. And I got to the meeting. There were about a hundred people in the room. I have a terrible fear of public speaking. My former partner kn knows that. And I gave the lead uh, and our, our main goal when we do this kind of talk is it's just to help at least one person in that room. And a young woman had approached me after the meeting and, you know, she disclosed how you know, there were some similarities and, and, you know, some things I had shared really made her feel seen. And so as I was leaving, I just, I felt really good. My, my cup was filled and I meet up with my former partner, we leave. And as we're, you know, walking to his car, the guy who had asked me to speak yelled my name. And uh, my my former partner and I, you know, we, we stood there as this guy was approaching us because we were all going to be walking in one direction. And uh, my former partner, as he was standing there, said, here we go. This is it. I bet he's going to ask me to give the lead. And my stomach just sank because it just felt so self-centered and, and self-involved. And especially after leaving a 12-step meeting, that's typically not where my head is at in any way, shape, or form. But the, the guy approached us and he thanked me for speaking. He you know, complimented me. And then he looked at my former partner and he said, I'll see you tomorrow, man. And I could feel the tension. It was palpable. And we start walking back to his car. He's not speaking to me at all. We get in the car and I was still feeling like the nerves from speaking in front of so many people. And it's such a vulnerable experience to, you know, expose oneself in that way. And so we, we get in the car and I had asked him, you know, did I, did I do okay? I'm feeling really vulnerable. And he looked at me and he said, I mean, you said the word literally about four times, but other than that, it was fine. And I just had this sinking feeling in my gut and I was quiet, you know, pretty much the whole way home. And we got back to the apartment and we were getting ready for bed. And I had asked him, Hey, you know, was there a reason that you, you know, counted how many times I said literally like I'm wondering what it would have felt like to just give me a, a nicety and he proceeded to call me psychotic and say that you know do you want me to roll out a fucking red carpet for you are you expecting me to coddle you it's just a lead it's not that big of a deal and then you know proceeded to be smirking as I started to cry and, and defend myself and, uh, get pretty elevated, which felt out of character. It was a big deal to him until he was not asked to be a lead. 
Yes. And that's him. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There was a sense of jealousy that I, I was not intended for, for me. I, I did not want to be in competition with my partner. I very much value an equal playing field and I wanted him to, to grow and expand with me. I wanted him to be the best version of himself that he could be. And it felt like when I was continuing to grow, not only in my career, but in my 12 step program and just in life and, and leveling up, he could never be happy for me. Um, just ever. It was really sad to look back and have that realization. So eventually you ended up reading Lundy Bancroft's book, Why Does He Do That? Why You Were In This Relationship. So what was the aftermath of this? So when I read the Lundy Bancroft book, I actually discovered the book through this podcast because I was listening to it while I was in that relationship trying to understand what was going on and discovered that book. And as I was reading through, I think he was a little bit of the demand man, but the water torture really stuck out to me. He had this even keeled temperament about him when he would be saying these degrading comments or you know, he would kind of, he let me know on several occasions uh, that he liked the way my eyes looked when I cried. And he would say that with a flat tone, or he uh, told me on multiple occasions that he liked to push my buttons to get a reaction out of me. But he would say these things that were in this calm tone, and I would eventually get a reaction. And he would then use that as ammunition to deflect any type of responsibility and blame me. I was the emotional one. I was unreasonable. I was dramatic. I wasn't happy or satisfied with anything. And in my experience, I felt as though I was initially just calmly bringing things up in the sense of, hey, it you know, kind of bothered me when you said this earlier. Can we talk about it? it would explode into this, you know, within me, it would explode because he would totally deflect and gaslight me in pretty significant, like it, it really hurt. Um, once he did live here, uh, I would be lounging in a t-shirt and he said, just so you know, when you don't wear underwear and a huge t-shirt, it, gives your vagina less novelty. And it just made me feel like I couldn't even exist in my own home. He followed an abnormal amount of Instagram models on social media. Like I'm talking almost a thousand and a lot of them were pretty young. And when I brought up that it made me a little uncomfortable, just given the sheer amount he he devalued me and told me I was crazy. And, um, you know, over time, I later learned what reactive abuse was. And it kind of made sense when I would have reactions. I I began feeling emotionally dysregulated kind of often. I noticed my anxiety had increased. I began seeing a psychiatrist and got prescribed an antidepressant to help with anxiety. I uh, oddly developed like some endocrine issues. I, I started having cysts in my ovaries that were hemorrhaging, which shockingly have dissipated since he moved out as has my, my cortisol. I, I go to a functional medicine practitioner and I get my blood work done and cortisol checked. And uh, a lot of my levels stabilized once we broke up. But as far as the emotions go and him living in his own world, there was one time where 
I had come home from yoga and there was a bottle of wine that was unopened and it was just on the kitchen counter. And he did not struggle with alcohol, whereas that is my substance of choice. But I went into the home office, he was playing video games, and I asked him, you know, what the wine was for. And he said that he needed it for cooking. And when I asked, you know, why he didn't think to call me and and check if I was okay with having a full bottle of wine in our home, he told me to fuck off. And he said that he wants to live in a home where we can have beer and wine and uh, liquor for guests. And I was super confused because pretty much all of our mutual friends are in recovery. So I, it felt like a deflection. It felt like he just wanted to shut the conversation down And he continued to double down on it and say, I'm really worried about your sobriety. I don't understand why you would be so concerned about having wine in the home. And I began then questioning, wait, is my program aligned? And am I making a big deal out of this? And so I took some time and thought about it. And I said, you know what? You're right. We can have the wine in the home. And fortunately, I never drank it, but part of me wonders if he was trying to kind of push me in that direction. So before I asked you all of those questions within the context of your story, things were devolving and you were afraid to talk to your friends. So what happens from that point? It just continued. He had done some pretty alarming things that I I didn't tell anybody about, but I had fortunately been writing them down in a a note, the notes app on my phone. But there was a point in time where he, it it had rained, I think a couple hours prior, and we were driving through a, a neighborhood in the city we live in, and there was a big puddle. And there was a group of people just, you know, minding their own business, walking down the sidewalk. And he went out of his way to drive into the puddle and it splashed them. And they of course screamed and he just started laughing about it. And that felt pretty disturbing to me. Um, There was another time where he asked if I could act distracted and be on my phone during sex. And I succumbed to that request. And afterward, when I asked why he said, sometimes I want to feel like you're just a whole um, he would, you know, toward the end, it, it got to the point where if I was crying over something that he would say, he'd say, stop crying. It's so annoying or, oh my God, what now? And it just made me feel like a burden. And, um, you know, I was just so enmeshed and en- en- entrenched in that like high, high cortisol of the arguments and, um, all those dopamine surges that I would get, you know, when it, when it did feel like we were on the same team. So it was just this super confusing dichotomy of emotions that would, you know, were, were present on a day-to-day basis. So you're getting these push and pulls, verbal abuse, you know, and, you know, with what you just said, he doesn't see you really as a human at all. And the way he splashes people along the side of the road, he doesn't see them as having feelings either. Like it's his world and he's in control and he has power. And that seems to be him, really. He doesn't understand others' feelings at all. It felt like that. It, it, he would make comments about friends of mine. I remember one of my girlfriends uh, went through a, a pretty sad breakup and I had mentioned that to him and his immediate response was, she's going to have a really hard time. And I asked, what do you mean by that? And he's like, because she's ugly. And it, it, I had a visceral reaction and I said, what do you mean by that? How could you say that? And he said, you know, it's true. 
you know I'm right. And there's just so many examples of comments like that or um, when my father would come to visit, you know, he would let me know that it wasn't his ideal way to be spending t- his time. And meanwhile, when his mother would come into town, I would, without fail, just spend time with her one on one time and, and plan fun things for us to do. And I never once complained about that. I just, I liked to, I liked to do that because she's his family. But um, he, I, I later found out that he had been telling people things like, I'm not feminine enough, or I'm not even cool. And that is when I kind of knew that something was amiss. You know, I was probably going to be <laughs> discarded, discarded. And I this all happened within like a couple days, but something else that just came to mind as far as the water torturer goes is he would have this smirk on his face. So he would say something that was so utterly cruel and heartless. And that would put me in this state of almost shock, like tightness in my chest. And he would stand there or sit there or lay there and and be smirking. It was almost as though he was so pleased with himself for getting a reaction out of me, whether it was shock, whether it was tears, whether it was yelling or defending myself he just seemed pleased every time he would get any type of reaction out of me. And it was pretty eerie. So at the end of the relationship, I began completely distancing myself from him. I was spending as much time as possible with friends and I leaned into my hobbies and my 12 step program heavily and really started to think about next steps. And As my three years of sobriety approached, I had vowed not to spend the day with him whatsoever because the year prior at my two-year sober anniversary, he had made it very known that he didn't understand why I wanted to celebrate the day when honestly, my only request was to grill on the back porch and just chill. It's my sobriety day is in the summer, but So on that day of my three-year sober anniversary, I went to work and I only worked until the afternoon and I I hung out by a friend's pool and then hung out with some girlfriends and got dinner with them. And I was in such a good mood when I got home and he was in a terrible mood. He did not want to hear about my day. And I just remember the energy felt so different. And I walked into the living room and there was a bouquet of flowers from him. And there was a a card that, you know, had nothing really of significance written inside, which felt different as well. And he had gotten me a bottle of his favorite salad dressing, which I found quite strange. And my gut just sank. I knew something was, was off. Um, And then the following day, I had gone to a meeting with two of my sponsees and we got brunch afterward. And I, he had told me that he had planned something fun for us to do that day. And I had mentioned, I wanted to go to a local arboretum and just kind of walk and be among the trees and, and nothing too outrageous at all. Uh, But so I went to brunch with my sponsees and then I came home and I was excited because I was like, yay, we're going to be doing something fun today that he planned. And um, as he was making a smoothie, I had asked like, so what are we going to do today? And he was just super disinterested. And he said, I figured we could bike to the beach. And it was about 97 degrees that day. It was super hot. And I just wasn't sure that I wanted to bike to the beach in that heat. And uh, when I said that, he was like, well, it's a great day to bike to the beach. And it was a realization that we were going to do whatever he wanted to do 
on that day. And I just began to tear up. And he said, stop crying. Why can't you cooperate for once? And, uh, you know, I, I said, well, I am trying to cooperate. I just thought that we were going to do something different. And he then, you know, began to yell at me and said, we're done. And proceeded to tell me that he had planned a surprise party for me that was going to happen later that evening at the apartment. Now, that is a sweet gesture. But interestingly, I had told him about a week or two prior a situation from my childhood that made me dislike surprise parties pretty, pretty heavily. And so um, it was just again gut wrenching to to I wasn't sure if he had done that on purpose to hurt my feelings or he just literally had not been listening so we did end up going to the beach and at this point I knew about the surprise and walked up the the stairs on the balcony and um there was confetti in my face. It was super loud. And you know, I was being recorded. And two of my best friends immediately recognized that I was not in a good state of mind. And so they, you know, kind of ushered me into my bedroom. And uh, I had let let them know kind of what happened earlier in the day and that I felt super guilty because he had told me he put in so much effort for the surprise party. And my friend affirmed to me, she said, he planned this less than a week ago. And because it was so last minute, a lot of people actually could not be here. And she said, I bought the cake. I set everything up and he sent us all a text to bring our own meat, to bring our own drinks. And that was pretty much it. And so it just felt overwhelming. You know, it, it, I just started crying. I actually, you know, later that night started thinking about killing myself. I had, I had never been there mentally in my life. It just felt like the easiest option. And, um, I, told one of my friends via text that that's how I was feeling because I was laying in bed next to him and I thankfully was able to just get some rest and I woke up in the morning and he and I each did our own thing and he came home that evening and took a shower and came into the living room and said we have to rip the band-aid off I I'm sorry this didn't work out and just kind of walked into the bedroom and I was upset. I, I felt pretty taken aback, but he then, I, I was in the living room and he came out of the bedroom and started screaming and pointing at me saying, you've ruined my serenity. You're a terrible person. You're a mean person. I hate you. Fuck you. And it was in that moment that I actually felt immense relief because I was watching him, you know, kind of have this experience that felt not aligned with what my reality was in that moment. And all I could say to him was, I'm sorry that this is how you experience me. This is not how I experience myself. And when I would just kind of shut it down, he began getting angrier and angrier and he went into the kitchen and he called one of his friends and I was still in the living room and we were not within eyesight of one another and I was just quietly sitting here and he called his friend and he said I finally ripped the band-aid off dude and I don't know what his friend said but my former partner said yeah she's standing right in front of me man you got a couch. And again, it just felt like this healing light kind of just like surged through me because it, 
it, it just felt relieving to have it be done. And uh, I, I think somebody, you know, was looking out for me somewhere. Um, cause it was some, it, it felt truly felt like I didn't have it within me to end the relationship. And, you know, after that ends, you, you have this sense of relief. So, you know, what happens after this? And I guess, how long did it take you to piece together what you had been through, what had happened, and how everything affected you and to and to go about the healing process? So the healing process was kick started pretty easily because of his behavior after all of this. So that evening he had left and I think it was the following day he came while I was at work and he took his computer to play his video games and his computer chair. And that was it. That was all he had taken for two weeks. Um, Later that week, he had come in while I was at work and he just randomly took the shower curtain. And I think he was trying to get a reaction out of me. I never reached out. I just simply got a new shower curtain. Um, he owes me a pretty significant amount of money and that I just assume I will never see. He left the bedroom, you know, when he did finally move out, it, it had to be, uh, my father was coming here and, and he just kept pushing and delaying when he was going to get his stuff. And that was the only, you know, form of communication we'd been having. And finally, after his like third reschedule of when he was going to get his things out, I said, you know, my father is coming this weekend. So I think it's in everybody's best interest for you to, to get your things out of here. And miraculously he took care of it, but um, about a week after he moved out. So this point, well, at this point, all that was gone was the, his, his computer game stuff, but I'd had some girlfriends over. We, we burned some photos and memorabilia in, in the fire pit in my backyard and they helped me sage my apartment. It was just very woo woo and it was very healing. And, um, I loved that. And, I, since he made that comment about more, a little more than a year ago about how he didn't like how I was working out at the gym, I had joined the yoga studio and I have formed like really solid connections with some of the women who attend that yoga studio. And I just began going to, you know, events that I was getting invited to. I actually recently signed up to do yoga teacher training in a different country um, in the spring of next year as kind of a, an ode to my own healing because that yoga studio really was a safe haven for me when I was wanting to not be in my apartment and really wanting to just move my body in a way that felt authentic to me. And uh, without feeling like my former partner was, was judging me. Um, I began educating myself on narcissistic abuse, you know, through Lundy Bancroft, uh, Dr. Romani, this podcast, and I've just been able to, as best I can handle all of this with grace and resilience. I, I think once I began not only listening to this podcast, read the Lundy Bancroft book and read, it's not you by Dr. Romani is when I really started to feel Like I didn't have to blame myself anymore because for a lot of that relationship, I was questioning, like, am I the problem here? Maybe it was me, something I was doing wrong that caused him to be acting this way. Maybe I was being too picky. Maybe I was too emotional. Maybe I, you know, I I really put a lot of blame on myself and um, through different resources. I've been able to distance myself from that. I understand that I, there were aspects of that relationship where I did play a part 
in some of the dysfunction, but I do not believe that I was the root cause of the dysfunction. Um, and yeah, I've just been really thankful for my female friendships. I'm glad that I maintained them throughout the course of the relationship. They were really sad to hear some of the things that he had said to me that I hadn't told them. Um, and I think most importantly, like I've remained sober throughout all of this. I, you know, I get to wake up and speak kindly to myself and my, my energy in my home feels a lot lighter. Um, I've just been trying to release this resentment that I held on to him for, you know, the past, you know, since our breakup. So, um, it's just been really nice to, to reacclimate me with me and lean into people who support me. And if you had any words of wisdom for everyone listening, what would they be? Honestly, that book, why does he do this by Lundy Bancroft? It was so eye opening to discover. And it, it really helped me put the language to what was going on and make sense of my life that felt so confusing otherwise. So Tiff, we are here at the end and today you had the lead and I am not Brian. I am Brandon. Sometimes people get my name wrong when I speak too fast. And if you're at Starbucks, sometimes they, they could write Brian on, on, on the cup. But, you know, your ex would never have the lead on this show. And today was your day. And just like you did at that meeting, you know, your job here today was to validate people's experiences, what they went through. And you did that today in a myriad of ways from feelings to stories, to the little tiny things that are said to the types of people that others might be dealing with. You really got in there and, you know, really help people today understand who they're dealing with. And I just really can't thank you enough for, for being here, um, with us today. And I hope that your cup was filled uh, as it was on that day by by being here. And I think for you, today is, you know, your way of giving back, but it's also the end of the road here for you that you don't need us anymore. So, you know, thank you for doing this. Thank you so much. This podcast has seriously helped me and it's an honor to share my experience and hopefully help others who might share similar experiences to me. Well, thank you, Tiff, for being here once again. And if you want to be a guest like Tiff was today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com and click on the guest form button at the top of the page. And there you can read all of our instructions and please read them all and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out the guest form and press the submit button. And please do send it in the format that we ask for. And we have friends of the show called Shelter Movers, everyone. And you can find Shelter Movers at sheltermovers.com. And what they do is they help you move all of your stuff from your home into storage. And that can be for your pets and livestock, too. So if you're trying to get out of domestic violence and course of control and you need help leaving the home, getting all of your stuff out of the home and into storage, including your pets and livestock, too, you can go to sheltermovers.com. They're only available in Canada. It is a donor-supported charitable organization. So if you need help from them or just want to donate to them, go to sheltermovers.com. And that is it for today's episode, for today's survivor story. So for myself and Tiff, we hope you have a good night. <laughs>